Okay. Thank you all for coming uh, to this symposium. It's uh, my pleasure to uh, have brought some people together to talk about something that's only recently uh, become something we work on in my lab, and that's suboptimal behavior, a suboptimal choice. I'm Aaron Blaisdell from uh, UCLA, or UCLA, and <laughs> which I learned about the last time I was at Cinca that that's how it's pronounced, so I, forgive me if I sometimes slip and say UCLA. Uh, I want to thank uh, Felipe Cabrera and the other organizers for allowing me to come and present uh, and to have this symposium here. I don't want to take too much time in these intro remarks just basically to say we have four presentations in this uh, two-hour slot. And so each presentation after them we'll have a little bit of Q&A for each one. And then at the end, hopefully we'll have some time for some more general maybe comments and questions about from the whole panel of uh, speakers. Uh, so that's what we have on the agenda. So why don't I introduce our first speaker. Uh, Vladimir Ordunia is going to present on, on the search of species, generality, and suboptimal choice. Uh, hi, good afternoon. Uh, first of all, I want to thank the invitation of Aaron Blaisdell and Sinca for this symposium. Uh, well, uh, life is full of choices. Uh, imagine a simple choice situation like the one that we are seeing, uh, in which we have to choose between two, two roads, the left and the, the, the right. Uh, Imagine that when you have gone through the left path, uh, you used to find uh, beautiful apple trees with very good apples with probability uh, 0.5. Uh, you know with this stimulus that you could be eating an apple 10 minutes later. Uh, but in other occasions, uh, with probability 0.5, you find uh, a tree without apples. Uh, certainly you can know that you will not be eating an apple 10 minutes later. Um, if you go through the right road, uh, you will certainly find uh, an apple, uh, a, a tree apple. Uh, which one would you choose? Um, it seems obvious that the best alternative is the, the right road. So you will be surprised of knowing that most of the pigeons uh, in a famous experiment made in, in 1974 by Kendalls did the opposite. Uh, most of them uh, preferred the left uh, path. Uh, if you think it is an absurd result, uh, you will understand that there is a lot of research uh, dedicated to finding what, uh, why pigeons did this. Uh, in a more modern version of Kendall's procedure uh, made by Professor Sental and co-workers, uh, pigeons choose between two alternatives signaled by the same color. Uh, these represented two white keys in an operant chamber for pigeons. Uh, when pigeons go uh, for this alternative, they get in 20% of the trials a red key, and they can know that 10 seconds later they will find food. But in the remaining 80% of the trials, uh, the key turns red, and 10 seconds later, no food is delivered. Uh, but if pigeons go to the other side, the non-discriminative alternative, they can find either of two keys, and when they find them, 10 seconds later, food is delivered with probability 0.5. As was the case in my previous example, pigeons uh, show a strong and consistent preference for the discriminative alternative, which, as, as you can see, uh, gives probability only in 20% of the trials when the other alternative gives reinforcement with probability 0.5. Uh, 
Um, uh, in the last uh, decade, much research has been devoted to understanding this phenomenon, and we know that uh, one of the predictors of suboptimal choice is the degree of impulsivity that the subjects have. Uh, for example, it, uh, it was shown that uh, high impulsive subjects uh, have a higher preference for the suboptimal alternative than low impulsive subjects. Uh, it is precisely this relationship with, uh, which gave rise to our interest in suboptimal choice. Uh, Emmanuel Trujano, my first PhD student, was interested in evaluating spontaneously hypertensive rats which are supposed to model uh, attention deficit hyperactivity disorder. Um, taking this relationship, uh, we hypothesized that if these rats are really impulsive, they should be more uh, suboptimal. Um, However, there was no uh, procedure for evaluating this in rats, so we had to adapt the pigeon's choice procedure to, to rats. Our adaptation was rather straightforward. Uh, we had two levers, as pigeon experiments had two keys, and two different stimuli over each lever, which signaled the different uh, possible outcomes. Here we have an example of a, of a choice trial. We have two levers uh, in either side of the, of the feeder, and a white light over the lever signal the, signals the availability of the alternative. Uh, if it is the discriminative alternative and uh, rats press this, this lever, uh, this stimulus will, will turn on in 20% of the trials, and 10 seconds later, food will be delivered. In the remaining 80% of the trials, this stimulus uh, turns, turns on, and food will never be delivered. Uh, but if rats press the lever in the other side, uh, either a red light or a blue light can be turned on, and uh, 10 seconds later, food will be delivered with probability 0.5. So this, has, this alternative is associated with a 0.5 probability of reinforcement, and this one with a 0.2 probability of reinforcement. Uh, we found a surprising result. Rats from both strains were equally close to optimality, uh, and we know that it was not a position bias because uh, we made a reversal phase. Although the experiment was intended to analyze differences between strains, we thought that the strong difference that we found uh, when compared with pigeons was more relevant, and we focused on, it, on this difference in our first paper on the topic. And uh, we wondered about the possible mechanism. Um, a difference between species in conditional inhibition seemed a possible candidate. So I want to make a parenthesis and explain some concepts, uh, very, very basic concepts of conditional inhibition. If a tone is contingently paired with food, tone becomes a conditional exciter. And if a compound tone plus light is associated with no food, light becomes a conditional in, in, inhibitor. Uh, in the suboptimal choice procedure, the discriminative stimulus that reliably predicts reinforcement should become a condition of exciter, and the stimulus that predicts the absence of reinforcement should become a condition of inhibitor. However, uh, it is not the case for, for pigeons. Uh, we know that a condition of, that a stimulus is a condition of inhibitor because when we present both the positive and the negative stimulus, the response rate should decrease when compared to only the positive stimulus. So in this uh, data suggests that pigeons are behaving with the compound, the positive and the negative, in a very similar way to when only the positive stimulus is presented. This suggests 
that the negative stimulus is being ignored by the pigeons. In contrast, uh, you can see that when we present both stimuli to rats, they act like if only the negative stimulus is presented. So uh, we suggested in a second paper on this topic that conditional inhibition is persistent uh, when rats are tested in the suboptimal choice uh, procedure. Uh, this is our first hypothesis. Uh, with the uh, available data, uh, we cannot reject the possibility that those differences are explained by differences in the condition and inhibition process of this species. Uh, I am glad that in one of the next talks, uh, we will get more information on this topic. Uh, at the same time that we were performing these experiments, uh, a second hypothesis arose. Uh, it was related to incentive salience. Uh, let me take a few moments to give some basic concepts related to incentive uh, salience, most of them related to auto-shaping in pigeons and auto-shaping in rats. Uh, when a stimulus reliable predicts food, it acquires the ability to predict the, the, the food, and then the conditioned response emerges. However, besides this predictive value, some stimuli also acquire value on its own and become powerful conditioned reinforcers. This is particularly true uh, for some relationships between the species to which an organism belongs and the stimuli employed. Uh, there are several procedures for evaluating the incentive salience, uh, but auto-shaping is one of the most employed. In the typical auto-shaping procedure, um, uh, a light is presented for eight seconds, then food is delivered for, for three seconds, the animal eats, but as training progresses, uh, we observe that uh, when the key is illuminated, pigeons approach and peck that key. Uh, we know that the key has incentive salience because uh, pigeons peck it, even in conditions in which by doing so, they cancel the presentation of of food. Uh, there is agreement in the literature that this process is heavily influenced by the Pavlovian contingencies. Uh, the procedure with rats is uh, very, very similar. Now uh, a lever is presented, eight seconds later food is delivered and rats approach the, the feeder. But as training progresses, uh, when the lever is presented, rats some rats approach the lever. These rats are, cal are called uh, sign trackers and are supposed to have high capacity of attribution on incentive salience. Other subjects, in contrast, when the lever appears, quickly approach the feeder. Uh, they are called uh, goal trackers and are supposed to have less incentive less capacity of incentive salience. This is a beautiful image from Terry Robinson's lab. I think it says more than many words. This is a sign tracker subject. This is a goal tracking subject. Uh, what does it have to do with suboptimal choice? Well, uh, if we compare Sorry, I lost my watch. If we compare uh, the procedures for pigeons and for rats, we can see that the illuminated keys that I used for pigeons have high incentive salience. In contrast, the sp spatially located lights that I showed you uh, before have low incentive uh, salience. Um, is there a stimulus for rats that is comparable to illuminated keys, keys for pigeons. The candidate number one is levers, because what I have just showed you in, in, uh, in auto-shaping. Uh, in a very influential paper, um, it was shown that if we have the discriminative and the non-discriminative alternative, but a lever is the stimulus, rats 
become suboptimal. And exactly the same procedure, but with lights instead of levers, rats are less uh, suboptimal. However, we noted um, a detail in this, in this experiment that did not allow us to take a firm position on the test of the, of the hypothesis. As you can see, the negative stimulus in this experiment was not, was not a lever. So uh, it did not have the same incentive salience, negative of course, than the, than the positive one. And being the condition in, in inhibition uh, an important variable on this research, we considered that it was important to replicate the experiment, but with a lever as the negative is, is stimulus. In this arrangement, rats choose by nose poking. We have a frontal panel, we have a back panel, each one of them is associated with the discriminative and the non-discriminative alternative. i give you um, an example of this. If rats nose poke here, in 20% of the trials, left lever appears, and then it gets food. The, the rats gets food. In the remaining 80% of the trial, this lever appears, and no food is delivered. In the non-discriminative alternative, after nose poking here, either of these alternatives appear and a a reinforcement is delivered with probability um, 0.5. Well, we, our results show it a close approximation to optimality, as you can see in the training and in the reversal, and good discrimination of the function of the stimuli. It was possible that we were uh, treating with gold trackers subjects and they didn't, did not have capacity of attribution of incentive salience, and that's the reason the, this variable was not relevant. So we repeated the experiment. We took uh, 50 rats from the general population, tested them in an auto-shaping paradigm, and classified them as gold trackers and sign trackers, and took rats from the extremes. Uh, and we observed that even though rats were different in their degree of approach to the, to the lever, they were equally optimal. So, uh, a summary until this point, uh, rats continue behaving optimally in conditions in which the discriminative stimuli have incentive salience. The discrimination is as good as it used to be uh, when testing um, pigeons. Uh, and we ask it ourselves, uh, do these results prove incorrect incentive salience hypothesis? Uh, we think that it uh, does not. Uh, we are in need of evaluating rats with other, with other stimuli, and we are in need to evaluate this uh, hypothesis in pigeons. Uh, in the following group of experiments, we explore the incentive salience hypothesis in pigeons in three experiments. Uh, in the first, we uh, intended to decrease the incentive salience by means of a pharmacological manipulation. Um, it, there is ample evidence that when administering a dopamine antagonist, the capacity of attribution of incentive salience decreases. So if we apply haloperidol, a dopamine antagonist to, to pigeons, uh, it is possible that they will decrease their uh, suboptimal behavior. Uh, this is the design, five subjects in each group, three doses of haloperidol. We found that the control subjects had typical high levels of suboptimal behavior, while the treated groups have lower levels of suboptimal behavior. Uh, the discrimination in the, uh, about the stimuli in the discriminative alternative was not affected. These are data from the control group, the low dose group, and the high dose group. Uh, another possibility for decreasing the incentive salience is to change the, the stimuli. In this uh, example, well, in this experiment, uh, instead of localized stimuli in the, in the keys, we had 
ambient stimuli, uh, LEDs were attached to the ceiling of, of the chamber, so the entire chamber could be illuminated uh, red, green, blue, or white, and we made the typical uh, suboptimal choice experiment. Another very important change was that we did not have keys. Uh, pigeons have to press a treadle, well, actually a rat lever. See? This is the final design, one lever at the right of one feeder. The choices were presented in opposite panels. Uh, we can see that seven of the 11 pigeons uh, were optimal uh, and they could make uh, adequately the, the reversal and we can show we can see that they show with good levels of discrimination. In another approach to the same problem, um, we trained the pigeons to make the choice response uh, by means of an entrance to the feeder. And here, the discriminative stimuli were tones of different frequencies and, and clickers. For example, the discriminative alternative had as a positive stimulus a tone and as a negative stimulus a, a clicker and the non-discriminative alternative, a very different tone. Uh, this is an ongoing experiment, and we are observing that during at least 60 sessions, suboptimal choice is uh, prevented when the incentive salience of the stimuli is removed. We see, however, a tendency to increase in some animals, and for that reason, we plan to expose pigeons to a higher number of sessions. Um, he, uh, the, the discrimination is, is very good, uh, and we have a higher absolute number of, of responses. Uh, well, we, then in this section, we manipulated the incentive salience in three different forms, finding support for the incentive salience in pigeons. However, as we did not find the same effect in rats, it is possible that there is a confounding variable that we have not yet looked at. In two of these manipulations, but the stimuli and the operant responses were modified so that it is possible that either of them caused the decrease in suboptimal uh, behavior. There is abundant evidence that changing key pecking behavior by treadle pressing diminishes the maladaptive behavior of pigeons. This evidence comes from different kinds of tasks like differential reinforcement of low rates. Pigeons are more efficient when treadle pressing than when key, pe key pecking. Uh, their degree of temporal discounting is uh, smaller for treadle pressing than for key pecking, and the behavioral contrast is almost absent with treadle pressing. It has been suggested that treadle pressing in pigeons is more comparable to the operant behavior shown by other species than is key pecking. So it, this uh, leads to our third hypothesis uh, related to the biological preparedness of the operant responses. Key pecking in pigeons is not biologically equivalent to lever pressing in rats. Good navigating in tunnels B. Uh, for analyzing this, we are developing an apparatus uh, in which the suboptimal choice procedure uh, will be presented. When rat enters here, it will, it will have two alternatives. This, for example, the discriminative. If it chooses to enter here, it will find an open tunnel associated with the positive or with the negative, or if the rat enters the non-discriminative alternative, it will find either of these tunnels associated with a particular probability of reinforcement. The most interesting part of this apparatus is that after getting the reinforcers, uh, they are, it is planned that they came back in, by the back part and begin automatically a new a new trial. Uh, this is our best rat. Uh, they are not yet in the suboptimal choice procedure. They, they are just being trained for, for the future. Our best rat made 200 cycles in less than an hour. Well, finally, 
I want to thank my wonderful team of collaborators. Uh, without them, uh, this experiment would not have been possible. So I want also to thank my funding agencies. Thank you. Understood. Uh, so, uh, the 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 pigeons, uh, w when they when you said they prefer the discriminative alternative, which one is the discriminative alternative? The, is that the one that's that's suboptimal, uh, or is that the one that's the optimal? The suboptimal. Uh, could I see the presentation, please? Oh, thank you. I know this. Uh, okay. Yes. So the discriminative, I see. Okay. I, I missed that at the very beginning. Okay. Sorry. So, so it's the one that, that, pay, that if they choose that one, if they peck at that one, it's not... Uh, uh, optimal, and uh, and then uh, if I understood what you're saying correctly, you, uh, uh, a a light that's paired uh, strongly w with food uh, will will have this incentive salience that you're saying. He's, so it, it, it becomes, in, in my way of talking, it, it's a, a strong inducer. And, uh, and there is something special about pecking uh, in pigeons. We, kn we know that. And, and they, do, they do peck impulsively. So, so all of that I, I, I understood quite well. And, I, and I, 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 my, uh, my mentor, uh, Hernstein, once said to me, you know, there, there are many ways to fool a pigeon. And I think, you know, you have to be thinking about it, how, you're, how you're actually exploiting these biological tendencies. I, I mean, you know, the, so, so it's, and, and in a way what you're showing is it's e easier to, to fool a pigeon than it is to fool a rat. Uh, The last one. I have a question about the drug. Was IP injection of haloperidol? Uh, the haloperidol was an IP injection? Um, no, intramuscular. All right, because I think uh, in my recollection is the 0.1 milligram per kilogram is so high that it shoots off almost the motor system. <laughs> they do nothing. <laughs> uh, well, uh, this was pretended to be the uh, lower dose. Uh, we we planned to have a 0.3 milligram uh, searching in the literature, uh, but we pigeons failed to respond with that. And as you can see in the discrimination data, uh, pigeons are working as if they have nothing in their, in wow. their bodies. Thank you. Okay. Oh, how do you do that? You don't have it on time, do you? Uh, no. Okay. Okay, that was oh. weird. Oh. It's timing itself. Okay, let's quickly <laughs> read the title. No, wait, wait, wait. <laughs> That's weird. You think you can fix it in like one minute or less? I know. 
All right, so my, the next talk is by Valeria Gonzalez, Armando Machado, and Marco Vasconcelos, Integration and Use of Information in the Suboptimal Choice Task. Okay, I'm gonna stand over here so you can see me. Um, so, So this that you already saw uh, is what I'm going to be talking today. So first, I'm going to start with a little bit of background, trying to not repeat myself with what um, was already presented. Then I'm going to present some models that I'm being used to explain this task, just three of them, because we don't have infinite time. Then I'm going to present our proposal that we have been working in our lab, and two experiments that we run to test this hypothesis. And finally, we're going to compare this with previous models and get a couple of conclusions, if we can. So first, just to remind you, I know that you just saw this. Um, what I want to call the attention is that first, pigeons, I'm working with pigeons, it's just pigeons this time. Um, what animals are doing, they are just choosing over here. So whatever happened after that is just happening, independently of the response. So what I'm calling here alternative one, that is what Vladimir was presenting as the suboptimal alternative, we're gonna say that is effectively the suboptimal alternative, but it's also the informative one, because you have signals that clearly said when I'm gonna get fit, uh, food or not. Comparable with the other alternative in which, yes, it's an optimal alternative, but I need to wait uncertain of what is going to happen at the end of the trial. So as you noticed before, this phenomenon is quite reliable. We observe it with a lot of conditions, and it's been observed with pigeons, mainly starlings too, and sometimes with rats. So what everyone wonders is why pigeons are doing this, what animals are choosing this in suboptimal but informative alternative. So one of the first hypotheses that was um, introduced lately uh, was by Tom Tintel, that is over there. <laughs> so what basically this uh, within trial contrast is, uh, approach is saying is that the overall probability of reinforcement, so the probability of reinforcement that I can get overall in this alternative gives me an expectation of what I'm gonna get. When I choose the alternative one, I get a contrast if I see the red key, the one that is always reinforced. Sorry, I kind of hate the microphone. Um, so this contrast in this alternative is a contrast of, a positive contrast of 0.8, because as you see, I have an expectation of 0.2, that when I see this one, it jumps to one. So that is a good news if you want. The model is also going to say that even though the red key, so the ones that is never reinforced, I'm going to see that one four times more than the green one, it doesn't have such a strong influence, maybe because the contrast is not as big. But to simplify the message, we're just going to say that it doesn't have a big impact in the preference. In the other case, when the animal is choosing this alternative, my expectation is 0.5, but when I see S3 or S4, the expectation doesn't change because I also have a probability of 0.5, so contrast of zero. The second uh, model that I want to introduce is the reinforcement rate model. Uh, this one comes from a, an ecological perspective based on optimal foraging theory. So this, since it comes from ecology, is going to say that animals should be behaving in an optimal way. But this optimality, it's in nature and not in lab conditions. So it could be that what we're observing here is just a trick because the lab, it's a different environment. So what they're gonna say essentially is that um, food in this animal, sorry, in this task are searching for information. So there's information seekers, animals. And at the same time, 
they ignore the C, the S minus, because in nature, you don't have to pay the cost of being exposed to these stimulus. If you think about it, if I'm hunting around and I get to a place in which I know that I'm not gonna get any prey, what the animal is gonna do is walk away. You're gonna search in another place because there's no food there. But in the lab, the animal is forced to pay the cost of being waiting in front of these stimulus that is not gonna be reinforced. So they're gonna say, since animals were evolved from a natural environment, then they're prepared to ignore these stimulus. So it doesn't get, when ignoring, they're meaning that they has no influence in the decision. So, since I said before that they're looking for information, let's see, I'm not gonna go through the equation because of time, but essentially they're gonna say that they prefer alternative one, the suboptimal but informative one, because the value depends essentially in the probability of the S plus. If you think about it, if I ignore the S minus, it's like I'm choosing between one stimulus or one alternative that are giving me infor information and food all the time versus one that is giving me food half of the time. So that's where animals are biased for that one. And actually the model predicts that if you don't drop the times that you see the S plus to zero, they're always gonna choose that alternative. That is a crazy thing that actually has evidence that actually happens. So, and instead in alternative two, animals have to actively wait in the presence of the S3 and S4 because there is no information. So another thing that the model assumes in a later version is they include what they call an engagement function that is basically to deal with situations in which you don't have a perfect correlation. What happened, okay, we said that the zero is ignored, but what happened when I get one trial that is reinforced? Is that actually a zero? In which moment I cut the trial that, okay, this is not a zero anymore and this is actually a reinforced alternative. So to deal with that, they're gonna say that the probability of reinforcement of the signal determines the likelihood of engagement. So if I have a higher probability of getting food after I see a signal, it's more likely that I'm gonna get engaged, that I'm gonna pay attention and learn about it, okay? The last model that I'm gonna talk is the temporal information approach that this come from a more Pavlovian perspective if you want. They're basically gonna say, because this model is a little bit complicated, um, that what animals are learning is the temporal relationship between events. So basically animals are just learning the time in between things. So essentially they're gonna say that the subultimate preference is because they have information about when food is gonna be delivered. So this is the final equation. Now I'm keeping a lot of steps in here. But this part, the ones with the B, um, is the part that was related to the information. So they're gonna say that depending on how much it reduces the time uh, that I'm gonna get food when I see the S plus, is what they're calling here bits of information. So the bits of information is gonna depend on how much information an alternative is giving me. That it's related to the probability of reinforcement again. Um, but also they're gonna say, if an animal doesn't get the difference in overall probability of reinforcement between alternatives, we cannot call an alternative suboptimal. If the animal doesn't get that one is 0.2 and the other is 0.5, there is no way to say that the animal is actually choosing suboptimal because it's not getting what it, that they have different amount of food. So they're gonna say that animals are also sensitive to the difference in overall probability of reinforcement. That is the second point, that is the other part. Um, and what the model is gonna assume is that pigeons and animals are competing between these two. So they are taking both in account, but the value or the way that they assign to each one is gonna depend of W and one minus W. So an animal that only cares about the information is gonna cancel this part of the equation and you're gonna have, well, a W of one, so everything is about information and the same the other way around. This model also assumed that the S minus is ignored and a consequence of that is that there is no explicit description of how different sources of information are gonna be combined. Actually, what this model assumes is that alternative one, since the S minus is ignored, it only has one alternative, a one signal, sorry. And the other alternative, since both are the same, they treat that alternative as it also has one. So you have a signal here and a signal here. 
So the issue is when you have situations in which both, both signals gives information, even if it's a little bit or negative information, if you want, they have no way to deal with that. So what would we think about all this? We said that there's too many variables here. You have four delays, six different probabilities of reinforcement, six different color keys, and so on. So based on the literature and what previous models suggest, we reduce the task to two high order variables. We're gonna say that the two things that are uh, why the animals are choosing this is on one side, uh, it's gonna be the difference in probability of reinforcement within an alternative, something that we're gonna call delta, and the second thing is gonna be the ratio between overall probability of reinforcement that we're gonna call sigma to make it shorter. So um, this is basically the equation. Um, the, the red part corresponds to the delta. What we're basically saying, we're taking a little bit what um, Sendel was suggesting before. Try, try to not fall. Um, what we're basically saying is that it is a contrast. It is sort of contrast. So the only difference that we're not taking a contrast between here and here, but between the alternatives, within the alternatives, I'm sorry. So the difference, so since we have one and zero, we have the maximum contrast that is possible. You have one that is really bad and one that is really good. And in the other, that is the traditional task, we have no difference, so a contrast of zero. So this difference, this minus here is very simple. It's a delta one and the minus over here is gonna be delta two. And the other var variable is gonna be the ratio between these two. So I'm not, the, the preference is also gonna be modulated depending on how different are the two alternatives. If you have a more extreme difference in overall probability of reinforcement, you're gonna get, uh, probably uh, you're gonna attenuate or extreme the preference depending on the situation. So what we wanna do is actually test this. Oops. So in experiment one, we decide because the main point was to test this hypothesis. Um, we only isolate the effect of delta, so the difference, and we maintain everything else constant, especially the other variable that we think it matters, that is sigma. So if, as you see, we had the number of times that they see each color key is gonna be constant, and the overall rate of reinforcement is also gonna be constant, so it's 0.5 for both of them. So what we're gonna play around is gonna be with this. The delta, and by consequence, the probabilities after seeing each color key. So this is the values that we use. Essentially, we start and finish with a baseline condition in which both deltas were the same. The deltas were built in a different way, so in the first condition, the delta is zero, so everything is 0.5, and in the last condition, the delta was one, so everyone, the, both alternatives were informative. And in the middle, we have essentially two comparisons uh, 0.5 against zero, so 0.5 is 0.75 with 0.25, so it's, this was reinforcing 0.75% of the time, and this 25% of the time. Uh, so that against 0.5, and the same value, so the delta of 0.5 against one and zero. So if you recall the model, since you're always choosing in a comparison, we're gonna say that animals are actually doing the difference of the difference or a difference of delta. That is the value that it's gonna have. So we have three different values. So a difference of minus 0.5, a difference of zero, and a difference of positive 0.5. This is difference of delta. That is the values from here. So it's all the combina possible combinations with these values. So what did we got? So these are individual data. Uh, let's just look at the last graph. I don't know if I'm covering here oh, something. Hope not. Um, so the y-axis is uh, the preference for alternative one, and the x-axis is delta one minus delta two, so this difference. And the dots are the actual data, and the lines are the best fitting that we found with the model. Actually, no, not with the model, just the fitting. We're gonna show the model later. So we observed that what we, what we were expecting, that pigeons are preferring the biggest, the greater delta. So 
that's pretty easy. That was straightforward. Now for experiments two, we did the same, but with the other variable. We isolate as much as we can the all other variables. So in this case, the probabilities here were one and zero, so we give them the best scenario to see the effect of the uh, probability of reinforcement. Of course, this is constrained because we cannot, since this is one and zero, essentially this is gonna match this value. But yeah, we don't have another way to go with this. They're confound. So here what we did was going from 0.1 to 9, and the other alternative was exactly the opposite, from 0.9 to 0.1. Okay, so yeah. So since this is the ratio, what we were doing is have extreme ratios here, or a greater difference in ratio, and a middle one, and no difference in the middle. So this is graphed by value. Again, the, um, this is preference for alternative one, and this is just the um, overall probability, the sigma at the end of uh, sigma one. So again, we observe a sort of linear relationship between, but if you see, this is the average, you kind of have like a flat situation over here. So it seems that it's, it's a little bit what we predict, that they follow the order, but when the difference is not too big, it also seems that the, the fact it disappears a little bit. So how the models deal with this? So this is actually the prediction of our explanation. Ooh. Okay. So this is actually, this is the dots are the real data, and the line is what the model predicts. It fits pretty well. Again, not so good at this because you have a hard time with this sort of flat values in the middle. But overall, it follows the same order. Now, what happened with the models that I present before? So we just did a check mark to each of them. So this is for experiment one, that is the delta effect, and this is for experiment two, that is the sigma effect. So, oops, this is in a different order, but it's okay. So the temporary information approach was the last one that I present. So, and as I told you before, they were not, will, uh, they didn't have a way to combine different values. So when we have this situation in which we have the 0.75 with the 0.25, they have no way to combine this. So it's just, it doesn't apply. We don't know what to do with the model. But it predicts correctly the same pattern that we observed with experiment two. Now, the rate of reinforcement model, it deals, it does the same predictions for experiment one, so it can deal with the data, but it actually predicts because it, they assume that this, when it's zero, they don't engage, so it's ignore. You only have a situation in which both alternatives were the same. So what they predict is indifference. Now, finally, we did a trick here with the within trial constraints that we assume something. We assume that when the contrast was negative, they sort of dismiss. So we took a step ahead and we assumed that the only contrast that they care about in this account was the positive contrast. Contrast. If that's the case, they deal well with the first one, with the first experiment, uh, but they, give, they do the opposite prediction. That is a little bit counterintuitive and I think that happened to you before. <laughs> um, so yeah, we see that none of the models of the most popular models can deal with both experiments at the same time. So just to conclude, so animals are sensitive to the two variables and this is relevant, the special experiment to one to me, um, because a lot of models rely on this explanation about the information that these uh, signals contain, but none of them are, if animals are sensitive to information, they should be sensitive to different degrees of information. And that wasn't test before. So, I mean, it was test with a few values. So we wanna strain the spectrum and do a more parametric study to see if that's actually what's going to happen. Um, the delta sigma hypothesis is useful and it's a very simple account. We're not asking the pigeons to do a weird mathematical analysis behind. It's a contrast effect at the end. Uh, and maybe more important than that, we, with this model we have a new few predictions that are interesting. I actually don't think that it's gonna be correct, but one of the things that the model predicts, 
is that it doesn't matter the values that you have, the specific value after each signal. If the difference is the same, they should have the same preference. So let me put it this in another way. We have a contrast of 0.5, right, with 0.75 and 0.25 in the signals. The model predicts the same preference if you have, for instance, a situation in which one key have a probability of reinforcement of 0.5 and the other have a zero. The difference is still 0.5. Uh, the model predicts that they should also like that one. I honestly, and spoiler for other experiments that we're running, they are not in, they don't do the same. It's not the same, the value. It's, the value matters for the pigeon. Um, yep, that's pretty much which, all of it. Thank you. Uh, I just have a, a couple of questions. One, um, it, it seems to me you uh, haven't explicitly taken into account the impulsivity of the pigeon, you know, the, the tendency of a pigeon to peck at a key light that is uh, reliably correlated with food that uh, the, the previous speaker, uh, Vladimir, uh, was talking about that. And, uh, and it occurs to me that your uh, delta parameter has uh, maybe uh, is connected with the, the uh, what they were calling uh, incentive salience, I think. And, uh, and so, uh, I, I, I think, you know, you, you might want to think about the, you know, the way that this procedure interacts with impulsivity. My impression is, I haven't read all of, all of the research, so I, um, but, my, but my impression is that it, it all seems to depend on an initial link that's only one peck. If that's, you, that's right. Yeah, because if you make those initial links variable interval schedules, you get totally the other result. And, yeah, yeah, uh, they, and they that, that, that seems to me to be a kind of crucial point. Uh, so the, 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 the pigeons, in a way, are, uh, are tricked by the one peck initial link. Uh, and so. You know, you might you might want to consider just what's going on there. Why the difference between variable interval initial links and one peck initial links? Uh, I think of it in terms uh, of a difference between preference and consumption. In a, in a way, what you're studying is consumption, not preference. This is actually not, these experiments are not really choice. They, they, uh, the pigeons are, are acting impulsively and it's an, in effect you're, they're consuming rather than choosing. And, uh, or at least that's a, a way of thinking about it. Uh, I, you know, if, if, you, if you just give a pigeon two bowls of food, two different foods, they, you know, they'll consume maybe, let's say, food A. They'll consume more of food A than food B. But if you, if you make food A and food B the uh, endpoints of, of concurrent variable interval schedules, you may actually find that they prefer food B even though they consume more of food A. And, and so it's some, you know, that's, that's kind of the way uh, I relate to this. My other question is, where did that equation come from? Where, Which one? The equation you showed of the exponential, you have some rationale for that equation? I... Um, you mean literally what we choose that shape? Of, like... that, yeah, I mean the way you calculate your predictions with I mean, that exponential equation. 
we put uh, the delta as an exponent because we think it has more weight in the, in the decision. So in a sense, it's the delta is the main thing and the amount of food, if you want, is modulated in this preference. So that's what we end up with that. It's not, of course, it's not the only way, the only equation that you can come up with. Um, well, uh, yeah, that's probably true, but I, I didn't, I, I was wondering, you know, how did you, you know, reason your way to that particular equation? We, we were thinking, the logic behind was, if we're assuming that information is the main thing or what they are biased for, because we, we have from previous experiment that even if the, even if you extreme the, the difference in probability of reinforcement, if one is informative, then it's still are suboptimal. So they seem to be sensitive to that, but not that sensitive when you have one alternative that is informative and the other is not. So that's why we end up choosing that shape of equation, if you want, because the delta is what is biasing them, but we know also that the overall probability of food, it gets an influence too, but it's more a modulatory effect. Mm. Yeah, I'm sure that's, uh, I, I can see your reasoning, but uh, it struck me that there's probably many other candidate equations that, we, we uh, who knows, we, we would, try uh, would some predict others. better or, or worse, I don't know. But also you have like the other component uh, besides the exponential part is that one is a difference, that was also part of what we were thinking, the contrast, and the other is a ratio. We try especially with the sigma one, to try maybe it's not the ratio, maybe it's also the difference. But the difference actually didn't work out and it didn't match the results. So we, tr we have a few versions of the model, kind of with the same logic but different ways to account for that, and that was the best one that we found. Yeah, well, I would just say it would be, someone like me would be happier to to see some kind of rationale for an equation like that, instead of just We're publishing the paper very it. soon. <laughs> yeah, I just reviewed it. Okay, thank you. We'll have, try and have some more questions time at the end of the entire Okay, then this uh, next talk is by, again, Valeria Gonzalez and myself, Aaron Blaisdell. I didn't want her to have to give two talks back to back, so I thought I would uh, give the talk since it's our collaborative work. Uh, Valeria came to my lab um, as a visiting student for nine months, uh, I guess to take a break from modeling uh, and do some experiments based more on just kind of good old fashioned psychological thinking. Uh, and we came up with this uh, uh, work that we're going to present today. So the title is The Role of Inhibition in the Suboptimal Choice Task. The introduction is really, at this point, uh, not really necessary because um, you've already heard two talks on suboptimal behavior. Uh, we know that under certain conditions, maybe artificial lab derived conditions, animals, including humans, as Tom Zental has pointed out a lot, um, will behave in ways that don't seem to maximize fitness, um, choosing maybe in a food task preferences that lead to less overall reinforcement. And one of the primary tasks that's been used over the years to study this kind of suboptimal choice um, has been referred to as the Z protocol, after Tom Zental. And just a quick review of what we've already uh, heard the other uh, speakers talk about. Um, the, the entire design involves two initial link discriminative uh, stimuli present, pre uh, keys presented uh, on pecking keys and four possible terminal link stimuli. You train each of the initial link stimuli separately on separate trials 
and where they eat 20% of the time are followed by one of the initial, I mean, one of the terminal link stimuli, and on the other 80% of the trials are followed by the other terminal link stimuli. And then you have occasional choice trials where both items, uh, both initial links are given simultaneously, and you look to see which one, given an FR1, do the, does the pigeon or whichever animal you're studying prefer to choose. And generally under this procedure, with pigeons, you find that over a number of sessions, they in general uh, make, prefer the suboptimal choice. So graphing the preference for suboptimal, the higher the score on this graph, the more suboptimal, uh, more percentage of these choice trials, the pigeon will choose the suboptimal choice. And the question that we asked, and has been already, uh, in fact, brought up by Vladimir and uh, in the literature a little bit, is what's the role of inhibition to the S minus, the uh, stimulus like the red one here that's never followed by reinforcement? Uh, what role does inhibition of that stimulus uh, play in the development of suboptimal choice? So just as a little primer on inhibition as a process in learning experiments, uh, we know that in a Pavlovian discrimination procedure, such as in eye blink conditioning with rats, uh, with data shown here, that if you have two different stimuli, an A stimulus and a B stimulus, where the A stimulus is followed by something like a puff of air to the eye that causes an unconditioned eye blink, and the B stimulus is presented occasionally but not followed by the puff of air to the eye, over a number of sessions of such um, embedded with such trials, you find that initially you see an increase in a conditioned eye blink response to both stimuli, although a higher increase uh, in, in the eye blink, rate of eye blink responding or percentage of eye blink responses to the, uh, what we call the excitatory stimulus, the positive stimulus than to the negative stimulus. And it's only after an, a quite a few sessions that then you see the inhibition seems to kick in and to reduce the rate uh, or proportion of responses to the, the stimulus that does not signal the unconditioned stimulus. So inhibition takes longer to develop than the initial excitation. This is, of course, also demonstrated numerous times in uh, instrumental discriminations, where initially, let's say, a key pecking in pigeons, where you have an S-plus stimulus or an S-minus stimulus, as so you have sequential type of uh, discrimination training. You see over sessions, initially, a lot of responding to both of the stimuli, but after uh, enough training has gone by, eventually the, you'll see the rate of response to the S minus stimulus starts to come down, indicating some kind of inhibitory process is finally accruing. Again, indicating that inhibition seems to take longer to develop and influence behavior than the initial excitatory learning. Now, is it truly inhibition that's resulting in these decreases or is it maybe other kind of uh, phenomena like generalization? Uh, there's initially maybe generalization between the cues, but as they learn to discriminate them better, they stop generalizing to the, from the S plus to the S minus. Well, people going as far back as Pavlov have developed ways of studying these kinds of alternatives to see whether it is truly an inhibitory process that develops to the the negative or minus stimulus, like an S minus or a Pavlovian uh, condition inhibitor. So I'm going to show you an experiment from Ralph Miller's lab, a place where I got my PhD years ago. This is not my research, but uh, colleagues from that lab. And it's a fear conditioning experiment with rats using audiovisual cues like tones and lights as CSs and a brief mild foot shock as the US. Not really relevant for the purpose of discussion, but they, it's part of this experiment. There were two types of arrangements of the, the A and X stimuli. Let me just walk you through the design. There are two types of trials where there's just one CS followed by the foot shock. So T will be a transfer exciter, T followed by foot shock. Stimulus A is also is a training exciter, and stimulus A is reliably followed by foot shock. 
And then there's this third type of trial where A, the exciter is present with X, the, the putative inhibitor, what's going to be trained as a condition inhibitor. X is not followed. On the AX trials, no foot shock is delivered. And there, in part of this experiment, it's not really relevant to us, but it's part of the experiment, is that the AX relationship, they were either presented simultaneously or A was presented followed by X, on, so serial presentation. So that's what sim, sim and sir are simultaneous and serial. But what's more relevant to what I want to talk about now is that in both groups of rats, there were subdivisions of groups to those that didn't receive any AX trial, so zero in inhibitory trials. Only four of these AX trials, 20 of those AX trials, or 100 AX trials. All right, embedded in these sessions with these other two types of trials. And then what the test consisted of is to present T by itself, the training exciter, in which case you should see a strong fear response, and on other trials, T and X, to see whether if X truly in, um, acquired inhibitory properties, it should suppress on a compound trial, the response elicited by an excitatory Pavlovian stimulus. So this is what's called the summation test for Pavlovian condition inhibition. And these are the data from this experiment looking at uh, the, uh, this is latency to drink in the some water in the presence of the uh, putative fear stimulus T with or without X. And so the higher the score here, the longer it takes for the rat to start drinking in the presence of this test stimulus. That means the more fear they seem to be showing. It's a kind of a conditioned emotional response. We see if there were no AX trials, X does not inhibit responding to T, the strong fear. If only four trials of AX had been given during training, then at test also then, X does not seem to inhibit the uh, excitatory fear response by, elicited by T. With the simultaneous procedure, now we see that 20 trials of simultaneous AX um, minus presentations was sufficient to uh, significantly inhibit the fear response, and as does 100 trials, whereas in the serial condition, it took up to 100 trials before it became, uh, it passed this test of inhibition. Regardless, what you see is that inhibition takes time to develop. And this kind of summation test shows that it's not just generalization decrement, but that it is truly the development of an inhibitory property that's now exerting itself to influence the response elicited by an exciter. So having this little primer now, we can go back and ask the question again, does inhibition to S minus play a role in the development of the suboptimal choice? And embedded in that question is really the idea of whether S minus signals a negative value, if you will, um, the, uh, or merely a zero probability of reward. So we're gonna look at what happens with those S minus trials as a function of the amount of training. Now, before we get into our research, Tom Zental had already, uh, in his lab, uh, um, a student of his uh, have already accomplished this kind of experiment. And th their experiment was a little bit different, though. Instead of using a standard probability um, manipulation, where you manipulate the probability of reward signaled by the terminal link stimuli, in their procedure, they did a reward magnitude manipulation where in the, for the green stimulus, which will be the suboptimal choice, initial link choice, the red stimulus signaled a large food reward, 10 pellets, uh, always signaled 10 pellets, and the other stimulus, uh, terminal link stimulus signaled that they will always get zero. So both of these keys are informative, but unlike in the probability situation, also for the uh, other choice option, initial link stimulus, it's followed by stimuli that always signal a specific amount of reward. So we're not playing around with information uh, value in that sense that the probability task does. So 20% of the time a blue stimulus is followed the yellow, in which case the, they get three pellets, and 80% a white stimulus is followed by three pellets. Now in that task, they also develop suboptimal preference for the suboptimal choice um, 
but when, uh, when Zenton and his lab looked at the, this, and, and Vladimir already presented these as well, which is nice, uh, looked at what happens when you present these two keys together, the red stimulus signaling 10 pellets and the, this dashed line signaling zero pellets, you find that it's in early in training, such a summation test produced um, a, a inhibition or a, a drop in the response. But later in training, at session 35 or beyond, the S minus no longer significantly reduced the response to the compound of the two. So this is a little, seemed odd to us because it's the opposite of what we see usually with condition inhibition um, training. Now, there were a couple of issues we identified with that study that may be led to their not finding the same result that we generally see with inhibition. One, as I just said, they uh, varied the reward magnitude, not the probability. Thus, all terminal link stimuli are informative of the outcome. Uh, and maybe suboptimal choice, might, what produces suboptimal choice might differ between these kinds of procedures. And the other one, I think, is also that if you see, the S minus stimulus is quite different than the others. It's a shape, a line, a white line on a black background, and the other terminal link stimuli were colors. And many people, including when I was in Bob Cook's lab for my postdoc, many people have found that for pigeons, color seems to be a more salient dimension than shape. And so perhaps even if the, this uh, terminal link stimulus, the S minus, did acquire inhibitory properties, maybe it's not, uh, it's overshadowed, so to speak, by color stimuli. And so the color stimulus exerts more control over the, the behavior on a compound trial. So we designed uh, an experiment that asked, well, would we get similar results if we used a probability matching task, which is the more commonly used one, um, and using terminal link stimuli that all came from the same dimension of, vi of visual features. So we're going to return to the, the Z protocol, and for the ex first experiment, all we're going to do is just train the terminal link stimuli in, as uh, Pavlovian signals. So before types of trials, trials where an S plus is followed all the time, every time by reward, food reward, an S minus never followed by food reward, and an S3 and an S4 that are half the time followed and half the time not followed by food reward. The actual stimuli we use look like these. We counterbalance them across pigeons, but for one pigeon, for example, they might have these four double dot colored stimuli. And the re reason we chose those is so that after training with such stimuli, we can develop these compounds where they're um, embedded within each other. So they're arranged in such a way that the pigeon's pecking at this stimulus, and it's a relatively small stimulus on the screen such that they can't isolate the pecks quite readily. The, if they're going to avoid the S minus because it's inhibitory, then they should, we should see a low rate of responding despite the S plus being there. So first of all, we see that over training, we just look at the normalized rate of response, normalized to the rate of responding to an S plus. Uh, which, so that would be black because it's normalized to itself. That would be 100%. But the other two excitatory cues uh, that are 50% partially reinforced, for m virtually most of the training, they're pretty high rate of response. And the S minus here in the dashed line starts relatively high in the first block of five sessions, but then drops down. So now that we have them at a low rate of response to the S minus, we want to ask on the compound test, does it produce the uh, negative summation effect? And so these are just tests on the elements, and we see, yes, S minus elicits very little responding compared to the other cues. And on these tests, anytime the S minus, which is these last two bars on this graph, the rightmost bars, these are where the S plus or which is 100% reinforced, or the S3, which is 50% reinforced, are presented in combination with the S minus. In those cases, we get a significant reduction. So we do see a summation test uh, is passed here. But of course, these cues were trained by themselves. So now the question is, can we go back to the full protocol and, and a full design 
and see if we also get evidence for development of suboptimal choice as well as development of inhibition as assessed by a, a, a summation test. Sorry, I'm just checking my time. Time is good? Okay. Okay. Sorry, I missed that. <laughs> Could you say it again, please? <sighs> Siri. So... <laughs> Defensive burying. Okay, so we're using the same pigeons in experiment two that we used in experiment one, so we had to change the stimulus set a little bit. So these are these beautiful initial link stimuli and these kind of little bit psychedelic also terminal link stimuli. But nevertheless, so you see we can then pair any the S plus or the S3 with either the S minus or the S4 in a compound test. So we use uh, there are the five birds in this task. And they all, by the fifth uh, session block, five sessions uh, per week, they were all somewhat or, or quite a bit suboptimal. So two of the birds were somewhat suboptimal. Three of the birds had a very strong suboptimal choice. We also see that if we just track rates of responding to the S minus, just like in experiment one, uh, in this terminal link stimuli, the S minus eventually goes down to very low rates of response. Okay. So that's good. But the question is, what about the, um, if we look at each individual bird, do we see that there's some kind of relationship between any particular session, how strong the suboptimal preference was displayed on that session, and how strong the summation test of inhibition was on that session? And so by looking at, we see that three of the birds that we had, the rate of response to the S minus, actually, I should back up, I should say this is comparing the suboptimal preference tracking with the development of the, the low response rate on S minus trials. So not the, the compound trials, just at this point, the S minus response rate. And for three of these birds, developed very strong correlations, negative correlations, so that the, the less they pecked at S minus in a session, the stronger they showed a suboptimal preference on that session. So they correlated very nicely. Two of the birds were not significant, but there was a trend towards that correlation. And overall, across all the birds, it was um, a significant trend or significant negative uh, correlation. We also then look now at the summation tests. And here again, the lowest responses were to the S minus, the trials where S minus was presented with S plus or with S3. Uh, and they were significantly below the, uh, responding to S, S plus. We also actually now, for some reason, even though this part of the, train, the testing was identical to before, we, it looks like we're seeing some generalization decrement as well. But finally, if we look at each individual bird, we find that uh, each one developed inhibition. Uh, one bird, Harriet, developed inhibition only on the S minus S3 trial, didn't seem to show, or actually did show inhibition on the S minus S plus trial, but even though there's a bigger difference here, that was not a significant difference. But overall, generally, they're showing strong uh, condition inhibition on these compound trials. So for the conclusions of the first experiment, we see that training on just a terminal link stimuli of a probabilistic suboptimal choice task allowed that S minus to pass a summation test of condition inhibition, suggesting that S minus signals a negative rather than a zero probability of reward. And in then the, when we embed that into the standard suboptimal choice procedure following the Zental protocol, a suboptimal choice did develop inhibition to S minus developed, and the strength of the suboptimal choice negatively correlated to the S minus response rate, especially for three of the five birds with the other two trending. So one question this leaves us with is what's the, what are the procedural differences maybe between our procedure and uh, Zental's procedure, the magnitude task that led to these differences? It also leaves us with some caveats and open questions. So we showed a correlation between strength of S minus response rate and suboptimal preference, 
but we didn't show th that there was a causal relationship in that development of inhibition to S minus was necessary for suboptimal choice to develop. We're planning future experiments to, to look at that. This does have impact on some of the models that Valeria herself had reviewed here in the previous talk, uh, where many of them say that what this, as the subjects develop a preference for the uh, suboptimal choice, they're, what they're doing is learning to ignore the S minus in the sense that it doesn't influence the decision process. But we show that subjects do learn about the S minus. They learn, in fact, that it has negative value. It subtracts from an excitatory value of another stimulus. Therefore, it doesn't seem to be a special condition. And it, so it remains an open question whether S minus is somehow inhibitory. Its inhibition is playing some causal role in the development of suboptimal choice. And I will leave it there. Do we have time for questions? Three minutes for questions. Billy? <laughs> Anybody? Federico? When you show the, um, uh, oh, you. When you show the, um, uh, this, um, uh, suppressive effects on S plus, yeah. when you show it, you know, compounded with S minus, is it done, like, early, how much training have the animals obtained? Because you showed us earlier that it takes time for that kind of, like, inhibitory, yeah. you know, yeah, I, I didn't show the development, but it, I believe it, you collected the data and so looked at it more, but it was weaker, so the summation tests were weak early on and they developed stronger, is that right? Yeah, we, we did many rounds. Okay. But the first initial time we did, the first time we did the S minus S plus compound was after 15, and, and it was less inhibition on those trials, I believe. Is that right? Okay. Yeah, there was different rates at which the pigeons acquired suboptimality. The ones that had already acquired suboptimality by 15 sessions were the ones that were showing inhibition on the okay. compound, the summation test whereas the ones that hadn't developed suboptimal yet were not showing inhibition yet on those tests. All right. Thank you. Yeah. You, 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 you know, you showed those graphs where uh, the choice dips down and then, uh, then uh, you know, and sort of, and becomes optimal for a little while and then goes up. And I wonder, th there's something I didn't quite get. Uh, it's, it seems like if, if the stimulus on the, on, on the suboptimal side that's correlated with, with extinction uh, is inhibitory, wouldn't that actually drive optimal performance? I don't, I don't quite understand why you say it drives suboptimal performance. I'm, yeah, it's counterintuitive. You would think that it would cause them to now avoid, maybe with value transfer to the, from the terminal link to the initial link stimulus or something. But what, I'm, what we're suggesting is that because it's suboptimal choice develops over time, and we know condition inhibition and inhibition to a discriminant stimulus develop over time, it must be the case that the terminal link S minus is developing inhibition by the time that they're showing suboptimal choice. And so I don't know if there's a, I don't know how to explain the causal relationship there. Do you have an idea? Tom? So um, one of the nice conclusions from the results of our experiment that you presented is it explains very nicely if conditioned inhibition disappears, then all you have is conditioned excitation, mm -hmm. and that explains the choice for the suboptimal performance. So Billy's question is it doesn't make any sense if conditioned inhibition increases, how do you explain the suboptimal choice? That that's the yeah. that that become. That's I, I know. think you know you're you're 
data are very nice, but um, <laughs> it leaves you with a logical kind of uh, dilemma. Right. You know, we still have I'm still racking my brains trying to figure out how that can work. But the models that say that they that well, if if they're ignoring the S minus, maybe something about the S minus becoming inhibitory causes them to not enter the decision. But I find that hard to believe. Yeah. Right. So I'm left so that's floundering. That's why our data made perfect sense to us, so we didn't explore it any further. All and right. now your data present a real dilemma. Yeah, yeah, and I don't have the answer yet either. Okay, mm. <laughs> good. Well, we should talk about that. Should we move on then? Uh, oh, one last question. Sure. Yeah, go ahead. Um, well, uh, I had a very similar question to the one that has been put forth about how innovation how could we explain the fact that innovation uh, drives suboptimal performance when it should be like the other way around? Mm -hmm. And just now I was thinking most, uh, most theories in this field assume that information has to do something with it. Information conveyed uh, by the terminal link stimuli. Mm -hmm. And maybe a possible option is that it's not just the information per se, but the different uh, the difference in the information conveyed by these stimuli. So, in the suboptimal choice in, in that uh, figure you have there, there is a difference in the information conveyed by the what's that like a yeah, uh, the diamonds? Yeah, the diamonds and the triangles, the triangles, right? Uh -huh. They convey different information about, in this case, probability of reinforcement. And on the other hand, you have uh, the circles and the, the stars. Those stars. They convey the same information about the probability of reinforcement. So maybe uh, conveying inform uh, the information of probability of, of a positive probability versus zero is less different than positive probability versus a negative value, which would be the case in innovation. So the, if that way, uh, innovation would uh, we could explain the development of suboptimal preference and the, the relation between the, the development of suboptimal preference and conditioned inhibition as a, increasing the difference in information conveyed by the terminal link uh, stimuli of the task. Would that be possible? It's an interesting idea. I'd have to think about it more in terms of information conveyed by uh, as an inhibitory stimulus. If I, I haven't plugged it back into kind of an information module of how, I, how to think about it, but I will take that into consideration. Yeah. Um, okay, we should, in the interest of time, uh, we'll move on. And again, I, I, we'll be here the rest of the day, so if people want to come and ask questions later too, that is, would be great. Um, so our final talk within this session is by Tom Zenton and Jacob Case, uh, oh, Jasmine Long and Jonathan Berry. Uh, and it's ephemeral reward task, why is it so difficult? Well, thank you very much. Uh, I was, um, I'm going to present a talk at the end of the conference about this kind of suboptimal choice. And um, to encourage you all to stay till the very end of the conference, um, I'm going to talk about it then. And I've decided to talk about something a little different, a different kind of task, one that is also suboptimal, at least certainly when I first, we first started studying it with pigeons. And uh, it was a, an experiment that was developed by a biologist. Uh, Bashari with fish. And uh, I was amazed that we psychologists have never studied anything like that before. And uh, so I thought the results were rather interesting as well. And his research with fish, um, these are the fish, they are wrasse. They're also known as cleaner fish. And uh, they eat parasites and dead tissues from larger fish's mouth and skin. And here is the task um, that he developed. Um, it's one that involves a simple discrimination between two plates of food. And if the pigeon chooses one of those, let's say 
uh, wait a second, if, yeah, if it chooses the white uh, dish, uh, it eats the white di food on the white dish and the plates are removed. If it chooses the black dish, uh, it eats the food on the black dish and then it can eat the food on the white dish as well. So it can get one reinforcement versus two and this seems like a very simple discrimination and it turns out that uh, it turns out that that's the end of the trial. It turns out that for these fish, it is a relatively simple discrimination. The data were presented as number of trials to criterion um, for each of these six fish. And you can see uh, all of them learn it, all six of them learn it within 100 trials. And um, what's uh, per perhaps rather interesting about this unusual, somewhat unusual task is that it was then um, examined by other investigators who, oh, I'm sorry, one more thing. Juveniles don't do nearly as well, so it looks like it is uh, a learned task, although it could have something to do with maturation. Other investigators looked at it with monkeys, capuchin monkeys, and none of them acquired it within 100 trials. They didn't go beyond that, so it's hard to know. Um, orangutans, four of them, none of them managed to learn this task within 100 trials. Finally, chimpanzees, two of them did and two of them did not. So the task is uh, an unusual task and the results are unusual given that these small fish seem to do quite well with it. And primates, our primate cousins, do not do nearly so well with it. Um, if you're a biologist, a behavioral ecologist, you look for a natural explanation for this, and Bashari has this wonderful explanation. These wrasse fish live on reefs, and uh, they encounter two kinds of uh, clients. These are the large fish whose mouths they clean, and uh, if the fish is um, a, a fish that is a bee fish, this is a visitor to the reef, and they have to go clean its mouth quickly, otherwise it will swim away. And if it's an A fish, it will remain on the reef and it can clean its mouth later. So it's analogous, the A and B, to um, the dishes uh, of food in which if they choose one, the other one leaves. And so that's his explanation. It is a generalization from the reef to the laboratory condition. Uh, my first thought about that is it's a very strange discrimination, a very strange generalization, actually, between the reef and the uh, laboratory conditions. So this is just what I just said, and uh, it just involves these two. And his argument about the primates was that they live in a different environment. They live in an environment that's nothing like this, and so it doesn't trigger the same kind of behavior. So it seems like a very nice resolution of the problem. Um, so you think about the A as being permanent and the B as being ephemeral, which is where the name comes from. And so you need to go to the ephemeral first because the permanent will be there as well. So foraging behavior with predators on the reef will generalize to plates in the lab. And um, is optimal, is it unique to species like wrasse? And uh, Pepperberg, um, Irene Pepperberg, some of you may know of her work with Alex and other parrots. Um, she did the experiment with parrots and found that they learn it as quickly as the fish do. And now we have an additional dilemma because um, not only do we have another species that does as well as the fish, but in many ways they, are, they live in a habitat that's quite similar to that of the primates. In fact, they live, uh, they forage for nuts and berries very much like several of the primate species. So that doesn't seem to be a very good explanation, but she came up with an alternative, an equally intriguing alternative, which is that fish and parrots choose with their mouths and primates choose with their two hands. And I have a question mark there that says, well, I'm not sure why that should make a big difference, but apparently, and one can think of after the fact, 
that when you're choosing with two hands, you may try to choose both, and you're not allowed to choose both at the same time. That's another hypothesis. Um, our thought was um, our pigeons are not as clever at this task as, uh, not any more clever than primates, and they certainly choose with their beaks. So we ran the experiment, same experiment, with pigeons. Um, are they like parrots or like primates? So we have a block of, uh, a choice block with two alternatives. We put a pea, a dried pea on each one. They like dried peas. Um, if they choose the yellow disc, they get a pea and the trial is over. If they choose the blue disc, they get a pea plus a pea on the yellow disc. And it's counterbalanced for colors over subjects and spatial location over trials. And much to our surprise, the results were that the pigeons did worse than chance, which means they are choosing suboptimally. That's um, where this comes from. The suboptimal choice comes from. They choose suboptimal under these conditions. So we tend to be a lab in which we use operant procedures, a chamber. Um, and here we have exactly the same experiment. It's a little bit different, of course, because they're not pecking at peas. They're pecking at um, colored lights. And if a pigeon pecks the yellow one, it gets fed and the trial is over. And oops, sorry about that. And the pigeon pecks the blue one, it gets fed. And afterwards, the um, yellow one is still there. And so it pecks that one and the trial is over. So we, we're looking for the generality of this effect in an operant chamber where we have a little more control and where experimenter effects are less likely to be uh, prevalent. And very nicely, we can see this is um, the first experiment with the manual presentation is the black dots and the automated is the white dots. And they show exactly the same suboptimal preference. Remember, optimality is above the dotted line and suboptimality is below that dotted line. So once again, they perform below chance. Unlike other animals, pigeons perform um, below chance. Of course, we don't know if you train just to criteria, and I would ask the primatologists about their results, and if, are the primates below chance or not? And they said they didn't think so, they weren't sure. So why do pigeons perform below chance is the, the first question we asked before we asked why they couldn't perform above chance. And um, we reasoned that what might be involved is that initially they choose randomly before they know about the consequences of their choice. And so on trial one, let's say the pigeon chooses yellow and the trial is over. And uh, the pigeon then uh, chooses by chance, chooses blue, and then it gets to respond to the yellow as well. And if you look at the accumulation, these are just random trials before the animal learns anything. But on these two trials, there are two reinforcements for yellow, one reinforcement for blue. And the second thing you might notice is that yellow is always the last stimulus that they peck and they're reinforced for. And so it may have something to do with the probability of reinforcement associated with each of these stimuli by itself. And so um, could this be why they can't learn? And how do we test this? Well, one way to test it is by removing the bias. This bias is two to one in terms of reinforcement ratio before they learn very much. And so on trial one, let's imagine they peck yellow and they're reinforced. And then on trial two, they peck the blue one. But while they're eating, um, what we do is we fool the pigeon and we change the yellow one to red. And, but they come up and they peck the red one and they get fed again. And so now we, what we have is a different distribution of a, the uh, trials on which reinforced responding is to the stimuli, one for yellow, one for blue, and one for red, assuming a random number of choices, in this case, just two trials. But it would be the same proportions. And so the question is, how do these pigeons compare with a replication of the second experiment in which they um, which there are only two colors. Um, the control group gets two versus one, just as before. And here's the control group, and you can see the control group looks, there's, there's a nice replication of the first two experiments. And here is the experimental group. Oops, I pushed the wrong button. Sorry about that, I just complained about that. Um, here is the uh, 
the experimental group, and, and they, they do much better. They're a chance. Uh, they're not showing the same bias, but they're also not learning it. And um, so uh, pigeons are not like parrots or fish. They are more like primates that way, presumably. We don't know exactly. All right. So what makes this task so difficult is the question. And um, it appears that the pigeons are not associating the second reinforcement with the choice that they make. I mean, that's sort of a description of what's happening. They, it is as if they, the two alternatives are equal. They respond to one. And then it's as if by magic, um, they get fed again a second time. But they don't make the association that it has something to do with what they did. It's simply um, something that happens. And it's really quite remarkable because everything, especially in the first experiment, is right there in front of them. So um, our hypothesis was impulsive choice may be due to the immediacy of reinforcement. This is something that Billy was mentioning a couple of times with regard to the other suboptimal choice task. And I'll have something, may have something to say about that at the at my larger talk. OK. It's as if the two alternatives are equal, and magically on some trials there is an extra reinforcement. And so that brings to mind the potential of delay discounting. Now, delay discounting, um, you're all probably familiar with this. The small, immediate reinforcers are preferred over large, delayed reinforcers. We can do uh, look at a hyperbolic function, which um, allows you to see how that works. Presumably, what we have is a choice time one. Here is a small, smaller sooner and a larger later. And you can see the delay function on a, a hyperbolic function shows that the, the smaller sooner has a larger value than the larger later. Uh, Racklin and Green showed this very nicely many years ago. But if you ask animals to make that choice a lot earlier, so um, it's at this point in time so that there is a smaller sooner and there is a larger later. You get it, the hyperbolic functions cross over, and now you can get the animal to choose the larger later. So the hypothesis was if there was some way of reducing impulsivity, in a sense, by making the choice response um, earlier than the reinforcer, then uh, maybe we could get the animals to learn this task better call it prior commitment, is what Racklin and Green called it, make the decision when reinforcement is not immediate. What if instead of a single peck, the choice requirement required the animals to wait 20 seconds for reinforcement? So we put the animals on a uh, fixed interval schedule for the uh, experimental group. And it's somewhat counterintuitive, I think, if we think about delay of reinforcement, because typically delay of reinforcement will uh, make the task more difficult. Um, the animal makes a response, then the choice response, and then um, at a later time, the, uh, that the results of that choice response will be differential depending on the response. So the experimental group uh, um, is reinforced for the first peck after 20 seconds, and the control group with a single peck, as in the earlier research. And here is the control group with the fixed ratio one, just a single peck. And you can see the results are very similar, um, uh, suboptimal choice. You can see, though, if we continue training, I think we ran only 20 sessions in the original task. If you go out to 40 sessions, you can see that they're inching up, but they're inching up to um, indifference between the two alternatives. They don't seem to be, uh, I mean, if we kept on long enough, maybe we would find creeping further up, but we, but we didn't. But here's the experimental group when um, there's 20 seconds between the initial choice, after the initial choice on the keys, the alternative, the single choice, single pack turns off the other alternative. Um, we see that they show uh, gradual improvement uh, in, in uh, their performance. And they reach a uh, performance that is 90%. Of course, it's a lot more training than the fish or the parrots had, but they, they do show learning. How are we doing for time? Do we have some extra time? Um, I actually don't have slides for this, but we tried this with rats as well, and we get very similar uh, performance. Rats that are choosing on a lever, left versus right, um, if they make a single response and they go to eat, and then these are retractable levers, so 
Um, if the other lever remains there, they can respond on that lever and they get reinforced for that lever as well, whereas plenty of time. Goodness, I really shortened this so I would get it all in. Oh. We're a lot more discussion. Okay. So, so we get the same results with rats. So this is not unique to pigeons and pecking. It also occurs with lever pressing. And when we train them, the, the only difference between the rats and the pigeons is the rats do not perform below chance <clears throat> with a single lever press, but they also don't learn. Whereas with uh, a fixed interval, 20 second schedule, they show learning that is almost exactly at the same rate that the pigeons learn. Okay, so it does not appear to be the evolved foraging strategy of the fish because parrots can learn it easily. It doesn't seem to be peculiar to the reef that the fish live on where they swim out to the visitors because they will, because the visitors are ephemeral and just like one of the plates is ephemeral, it will disappear if they don't choose it. Parrots can learn it easily, but it also does not appear to be that fish and parrots choose with their mouths because pigeons can't learn it and neither can rats, certainly under the similar conditions. The hypothesis is that animals that are naturally impulsive will have difficulty with this task. And um, we, we propose that the primates are extremely impulsive, the pigeons are extremely impulsive, rats are a little less impulsive, but they still show similar difficulty with this task. And it's still quite surprising, especially in the first experiment, where the delay of reinforcement for the second uh, reinforcer is extremely small. It is um, at maximum, it's about one second at, at the most. And the reason for that is that the pigeons have learned that one of those alternative uh, reinforcers will disappear if they don't grab it quickly. And so they grab the first one quickly and try to get over to get the second one, and it's, it's too late. But it's a very short uh, delay. Um, they can learn it if it's a much larger delay, and um, that seems to be an important consequence. And it turns out, I think, in other tasks, we have found that imposing a delay between choice and reinforcement seems to facilitate acquisition. Now, there's a remaining question, and that is, how is it that rats and parrots can learn it? And that is, aren't they impulsive as well? Um, and my argument is, and I've asked Bashari um, if this is true, that the cleaner fish need to be very cautious. After all, they're swimming into the mouth of a large predator and um, cleaning its mouth, and what's to prevent the predator from gobbling it up? And um, the answer, I thought, uh, without knowing anything about these, this communication, is that the, the uh, predator, or in this case the client, um, must signal to the wrasse that it's okay, I won't eat you. And the wrasse must believe, the credible credibility of the wrasse is that he, he trusts the predator not to eat it. And um, he must be sure that uh, the, the uh, client um, knows that he's not fish food, that he's going to be uh, clean the uh, predator's mouth. And so uh, there's probably some hesitation on the part of the wrasse before it just blindly swims into the mouth of the predator. That's my hypothesis. Bashari never gave me a direct answer on that. What about the parrots? Well, Pepperberg's parrots, if you know, have had extensive language training, in quotes. Um, and um, the question we had is, what if we tried parrots that had much less training? Um, here we're talking about 10 or 15 years of training with these parrots. And uh, I suspect that that makes them less impulsive because a lot of the rewards have happened to be giving the right response to a, a stimulus, and uh, what that does maybe is at least potentially reduces um, impulsive responding. So um, the take-home point, I think, the more general take-home point is the immediacy of reinforcement can lead to impulsive choices, and delaying the outcome of the choice can lead to more optimal choice. And the paradox is in the context of choice, Delaying reinforcement can facilitate learning 
by decreasing impulsivity. And as I said, I think we found this in a number of other tasks, very different tasks, where uh, animals, pigeons especially, tend to respond impulsively. And if we simply delay the reinforcement, we get a much better acquisition. Thank you very much. Uh, did you or anyone think of changing the ITI, intertrial interval? Well, we've never, we haven't done this with this particular task, but in general, pigeons are insensitive to the intertrial interval. In general, they appear to treat the intertrial interval as a new context that is irrelevant to the task. We find this in a variety of tasks. Matching to sample, for example, if the intertrial interval is less than five seconds, there's interference. If it's five seconds or more, there's almost no effect of the intertrial interval. I, th I think that maybe uh, the, qu the question is, so is something like, uh, you have a very high uh, rate of, of uh, reinforcers coming in, and it, it's possible that the pigeon actually uh, reduces the length of the session, you know, uh, and uh, by choosing impulsively, uh, it Reduces sort of what? gets th it gets through your experimental session in a in short order. You you see, uh, I don't know if that's what Francois was getting at. Uh, the, the rate of reinforcement is twice. I, well, it's very it's it's a very high reinforcer rate because you know they just one pack food. Uh, and then if, there's if you uh, if you don't have a significant intertrial interval what's significant to a pigeon 5 seconds is forever to a pigeon if you give it a choice between one pellet and five pellets 5 seconds after the one yeah. pellet it will go for the one pellet exclusively yeah, I, I, right uh, francois i think was or anyway i'm Ask, asking you're asking uh, cuz he uh, was you know what sort of intertrial interval 5 did, seconds you had 5 second intertrial interval the, there was a, only one question I had was a, a detail that uh, I want to make sure that you changed all the FR1s to FI20. So it was a, a fixed mm -hmm. interval 20. Sorry. Followed by FI, FI, FR1. That is the second reinforcer comes with a s single pack. Okay, so they're, f they're faced with two keys. Yeah. There's a, they're both fixed interval 20, but when they get the first food, the second one is then one peck. Yes. Okay. okay. I should have mentioned that, but yes. It stays the same. The time between reinforcers is the same. No, I, I was not thinking like a reinforcement theorist at all. I was thinking like a gestalt psychologist who would think of time as a stimulus dimension because there seems to be a problem with the second trial that is seen as a separate trial. Now, if you change the ITI, you're going to have a shorter time between the first and the second trial, and it will look like more a single trial, a compound with two trials. Gestalt, and gestalt, in no, time. I, I, I see that, and, and to some extent, I think that's what the fixed interval does. It makes the two reinforcers appear closer. Le plus proche. Are you French? Because that would do the same thing. Okay. Sorry. In, in, in your manipulation, when you, change the, the, you, when you change the delay between the first choice and the, the first consequence, I mean, you could do it too with the ITI. You could change the time either after the response or before the response. I think it would work about the same way. I mean, if the Gestalt view is correct. Yeah, I think with pigeons, for some reason, and it has to do with the salience of visual stimuli. When, the, when you make it dark, it, um, it, it, that intertrial interval seems to have very little effect. But that's, we could, we could try something like Sure, try it. Yes. Um, Anybody else? Yes. I have one related to rats. I have data showing you know, several experiments 
they, they learn to choose impulsively as a function of training. The longer they stay on the discounting task, the more impulsive they choose. You're looking at 200 days, 300 days of research, and the longer they stay, the more impulsively they choose. Okay. Can you, can you, can you have any ideas on this procedure? Can you try, try something similar with rats? I did it with rats. You I did, did it with rats, but that is not what you find. You find data consistent with this paradox pigeons. hypothesis, right? I find con data consistent with the pigeons. With the pigeons. In fact, if I, I thought I was going to run out of time, but I have a slide that actually plots the rat data on top of the pigeon data, and it's indistinguishable. Can we see it, please? I'm sorry. Can we see it, please? Do you, you have it? No? No. Okay, sorry. Thank you. <laughs> I, I, wish, I, I Thank wish I had you. kept it at the end. I should have done that just in case you asked, but I wasn't sure I had time even to talk about rats. I somehow had cut my, I had an hour talk and so I tried to cut it in half and I cut it more than in half. Are there any questions for all of the um, presenters now that you've seen all the presentations on suboptimal choice or related phenomena, anything that people want to ask or, or suggest? I don't have any closing remarks, but okay. Oh, I have a question for uh, Dr. Sentel. What does um, what does being naturally impulsive would mean? What what would be a an animal that is naturally impulsive? Well, I just talked about some animals that were naturally impulsive. Yeah. I can imagine. If you're asking why it would be um, evolutionary a value to be impulsive, no, no, no. I, I, I wonder, what does that mean? What uh, it, is there like a uh, is that a trait of a certain species to be impulsive? Yes. And why? And now that I know that you believe it, why do you think that is? Why? Um, if you're feeding on the ground and you're a pigeon, and you see some food in the distance. Or, or a little bit of food close to you, go for the food that's close to you because by the time you get over there, there are other pigeons or other birds around that will eat that food. And so I think um, we tend to value self-control. We talk about self-control as being good, impulsivity as being bad, but I think the animal evolves in an environment in which it is selected for generally not self-control, but generally impulsivity with some species in other species, less self-control. And in the case of the RAS, I think it's natural not, to, it's natural to have self-control. I think that it is naturally selected for, for being that way. Otherwise, those animals that show impulsivity get eaten. And so it, they don't have offspring. So I think that it's the, the niche that the animal finds itself in and, and the natural behavior that tends to breed a certain type of behavior, either more or less impulsivity. And I think what's amazing in humans is we value self-control, and I think that's largely because we live in an environment that's much more predictive than hunter-gatherers lived in. Things were much more random for them, and so they, there was a range that in, included a lot of impulsive behavior that was actually selected for, whereas now we tend to punish um, either by one's health or by one's uh, being put in jail for being terribly impulsive. And, uh, and so I think that uh, it's, it's, you know, it has evolutionary value. And in our current environment, those remaining uh, impulsive behaviors tend to get punished. Sorry. I, think I, I wanted to add to that, actually, in that when uh, we're talking about impulsivity, or when uh, it's in the context of, let's say, a feeding um, behavior. But the same species that might be very impulsive, show impulsive behavior feeding, might not in mate choice or something else. So we're talking about bio, you know, behavioral systems, and every individual species could be, show some impulsive-like behavior relative to other species on one type of behavior but not another. Yeah, so ecological settings will shape the, the way that the behavior systems really work.
impulsive behavior. And a lot of feeding behavior where you're coming across food um, unpredictably, you find it, you should go for it before some other animal gets it. In social situations especially. So we've come to the end of the session. Uh, there are posters out the back, and there are going to be posters on Suboptimal Choice. Yes, let's thank the speakers and the technicians in the booth helping everything run very well. And Tom also has a, a talk on Suboptimal Choice yes. at his last, uh, the last day. So let's go see some posters.